these are some more of uh, McGowan's bullet points. So I just want to go through these real fast. The goal of drive is false, obtaining the object, since its true aim is to continue missing it over and over again and getting jouissance from this repetition. Jouissance is found in the repetition of failed attempts to get the object, right? So that just says what we've already established. Desire is oriented around the lost object, whereas drive takes loss itself as its object. Drive is focused on loss more than desire. Why? Because desire keeps hoping that it will eventually get the object. Like there is an actual positive object that will satisfy it. <clears throat> desire seeks uh, attainment of the object, whereas drive gives up on attainment. The irony is that drive is the one that ends up getting jouissance, whereas desire is a defense against it. And so, uh, again, we kind of touched on that. Uh, death drive produces enjoyment, jouissance through lost. Drive must be unconscious. Again, that's the whole thing, right? Drive operates at this unconscious level, and that's why a lot of this sounds counterintuitive. But uh, drive is the logic of the unconscious. Uh, the unconscious obeys a logic of satisfaction, jouissance, and it gets this jouissance through loss, through self-sabotage, through sacrifice, through getting up, giving up the object, through missing the object. And that's what's so counterintuitive. I guess to, to simplify a bit, what is so hard to follow here is the idea that what gives us enjoyment is not getting what we want. That's what's so counterintuitive. But that's the psychoanalytic insight. Um, and that's why we give ourselves so much trouble, right? Um, uh, we don't want to get what we want because we enjoy not getting what we want. Is, it, is this just a us. way? Is this just a way of like doing sort of a, a naturalized apologetics for capitalism, though? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that I because know. I mean the whole point is that uh, it, look, Zizek uses all of this to show the problems with uh, capitalism. In that it's just parasitic on these, these mechanics and and thrives off of them to our own detriment, and that by becoming more aware of these dynamics, we're able to come into a freer relation with yeah, them. Yeah, but go back better. to the Fight Club, example, yeah. right? He's the perfect consumer, right? So he's lived like, the the kind of society that consumer capitalism tells him is the good life. He's living it, and he's completely miserable and wants to break free of it. So that death drive, right? Your the death drive in his situation, again, is the drive towards freedom to destroy this consumer identity, and so, uh, and, and we all know it. Like the, you can have all of the consumer goods, you can you know the video games and the clothes and all of that, and yet you know like somehow this is not going to give me the happiness with a capital H that advertising and pop culture tell me it's going to give me. So, hmm. uh, so the reason uh, why the unconscious is unconscious is because it obeys a different logic than that of consciousness. And consciousness obeys the logic of pleasure, will to power, self-interest, etc. At the conscious level, we find pleasure in attaining the object, getting what we want. Conscious will is driven by the logic of attainment, where the unconscious drive is driven by the logic of sacrifice and loss. Drive wants to lose more slowly, not get what it wants more slowly. It wants to like savor missing the object because again, it's through these acts, these repeated acts of not getting what you want that it builds intensity. It builds jouissance. And um, McGowan points out uh, Nietzsche's will to power is not a precursor for the death drive. They are opposites. Unconscious drive is all about undermining our power and not about giving us more power, right? Um, and I, I mean, it's, it can be inadvertent. It can go in the other direction. But the point is, uh, will the power wants to seek a kind of mastery over your, your position in the world, but Death Drive wants to blow apart your position in the world. So uh, the reason McGowan points that out is just a lot of people conflated will the power with Death Drive. And he's like, no, they're actually complete opposites. So... Oh, wow. 
But he it, it, and I think McGowan. Yeah, I is guess great that makes here. sense. But, that makes sense. Yeah. So um, this is this is really insightful, right? Because I think we've been building to this question. It's like you know the elephant in the room. And I think McGowan does a great job of answering this question. He says, but why loss? Why does drive enjoy loss, right? That doesn't make any sense to us. Uh, why would loss be enjoyable? Uh, we see examples of it all the time. Self-destructive behavior, war, etc. This all seems so stupid. Why do we do it? Loss and sacrifice create an object to desire. Think of the logic of scarcity, right? Uh, you want something because you can't have it. And so you n most objects around us are not objects of desire or even objects that the drive uses, right? Most objects are just physical objects. But what creates an object, like what makes it libidinal, right? And his point is going to be it is loss or sacrifice or an economic term, scarcity, that makes it libidinally attractive or seductive in the first place. So the loss itself creates a sublime spark in the object. There's always been a link between sacrifice and the sacred, right? We see this throughout all human history. <clears throat> loss gives something to want by creating something valuable. Uh, value comes into existence through sacrifice or loss or scarcity uh, or un unattainability. Objects are not sublime or desirable in and of themselves. We must sacrifice them into existence. Our self-destructive behavior is a way to keep us desiring. Through loss, we produce and experience the enjoyable object, and this is why loss has such a fundamental role in our psyches, libidinal economies. Sacrifice and jouissance are always interconnected. So he gave us so much there, right? He, I think he connects so many dots because you start to see why losing the object is so important because it's through loss, it's through not getting what we want that we continue to desire. And, uh, that, that you know, it, it's, it, it's an idea that's what keeps us moving. It keeps us uh, going as human beings. I mean, again, if we, we, if we really had every single need, desire, drive, satisfied, we wouldn't even be humans at that point. Like we, I mean, you just what you sit there like a rock, and for the rest of, I mean, it's bizarre, but you, we really are subjects of lack for Lacan and for Zizek, and without that lack, we wouldn't even be who we are, and so that's why our libidinal economies actually are geared towards us not getting what we think we want. So okay, uh, we're almost done with wrapping up the Zizek stuff. Um, uh, he's okay so it's impossible to take the death drive up consciously now we, we already mentioned that but it's not like you can just merge at the conscious level with the will of your death drive it's it's always something that's out of sight or you can never really align yourself with but it's always operative uh, and again it's because its logic is one of you know unconscious again at the conscious level all we do is fixate I want that I want this I want to attain this I want to get that I want money, I want a car, I want to get married, I want to like, all the stuff people sit around and talk about what they want. But that's what's trouble, troubling for us is that there's this other part of us, which is the unconscious, and the way it desires or the way its drive moves is toward loss and sacrifice and not getting what we want. So that's another way that we are just fractured at the ontological level. We're always moving in two different directions. And uh, that's why all of this is so foreign, because the point is the unconscious has a totally different structure to how it desires or yearns, whatever words we want to use, uh, however it wants. And uh, it's at odds with what we think, is, you know, how we perceive things at the conscious level. So the best uh, McGowan says the best we can do is reconcile ourselves to the death drive. We must face that it is always at work beneath consciousness and that it will always be with us. We must make a conscious allowance for the unconscious death drive. When it bursts into our lives, we should recognize it and accept it instead of trying to avoid it entirely. Trying to avoid it is what leads to displacing it onto others 
and ends in aggression. So it's almost as if we have to leave certain room for our self-destructive moments, even though they are self-destructive, because if we try to repress them into oblivion, really they're just going to manifest themselves in even stronger, more violent, more aggressive ways. So it's almost like you got to leave some room in your life for the ways that you fuck up your own life, because if you try to stop them entirely, you're going to, it's like you end up exploding. And, uh, so here, here in, in closing on this part, right, and we're going to go into the other discussion, but <clears throat> this, is, this is where you get into some counterintuitive stuff, right? Because so far you would think death drive and ethics would be totally opposed. But Lacan, Zizek, McGowan, they all connect death drive to ethics. And you go, well, how the hell do you do that? So McGowan says, both drive and ethics involves a sacrifice of oneself of all aspects of one's symbolic identity the ability to accept or choose an absolute loss is what makes us ethical beings this is why we can link death drive to Kant categorical imperative or the moral law death drive undermines self-interest and the Kantian moral law tells us to act without self-interest there is a real ethical component to death drive. Death drive has the possibility of ethics and the possibility of violent aggression, which happens when it doesn't take the ethical path. So that's the unique thing. Like to the truly moral act of sacrificing yourself for someone else, that is completely going against your self-interest. And so in a weird way, it aligns with the trajectory or the movement of death drive. And so this is one of these weird, really weird counterintuitive identifications mm. or at least associations. But he thinks that great ethical actions really can involve death drive. That death drive is this momentum that pushes us to sacrifice ourselves, destroy ourselves on behalf of somebody in need. So be a militant with that death drive. Exactly, right? And so he's, he's saying that there's these different options, right? There's where death drive can actually serve us in a highly ethical way, but it also can be behind the most violent, horrible forms of aggression we manifest. So Get it depends on how the death drive is being, and it's not like we have total conscious control of it, but this is where being aware of it can help us. Maybe maybe we can't like aim it like, like you aim a gun, but the more you realize what's going on on it, like it's not that consciousness never has any influence whatsoever. So uh, the idea is the hope that the death drive would end up getting aligned to a noble cause, right? That ethical opposed to a really horrible, violent aggression. Here's the other weird connection, right? Death drive and religion. Could you want to go, well, how does death drive and religion go together? Uh, there's another lecture McGowan gives on religious conversion and he doesn't talk about death drive in it but if you know his other work you know that death drives in the background and so uh, the connection works like this death drive can lead us to a religious conversion or to a Kierkegaardian leap of faith well you think like well why would death drive lead to a like okay you were raised Christian, but then you become an, I mean, it could even be like you were raised a Christian, so you become an atheist, or you were a Christian and you become a Buddhist, or you were a Muslim and you become a Christian, right? These kind of really strong conversions that people have throughout their lives, uh, how are they connected to death drive? Well, think about that famous passage from 2 Corinthians, it's a 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where St. Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now think about that, right? And connect that to what Lacan said earlier, right? Uh, Lacan says, um, will to destruction, will to make a fresh start. And you know, he says of death drive, uh, that uh, uh, given that it is uh, that given that it challenges everything that exists, but it death drive is also a will to create from zero, a will to begin again. Is that not a religious conversion? 
It's like you start your whole life. It's like a, you. It's a weird kind of reboot where your whole symbolic identity has changed in making a like a fundamental conversion. And it doesn't even just have to be religious. I mean, I think no. You and I made a conversion to philosophy yep. at a certain point in our Absolutely. lives that fundamentally yeah. altered uh, our whole sense of self, our position in the symbolic order, our worldhood, all of this. Yeah. And but, but religion's the great example of this kind of thing. So, symbolic death for the sake of a new symbolic life. This is a radical act of freedom. This is brings us to Zizek's great insight, and this is a. Uh, this, ha this I don't know. This this one really caught me when I read it because uh, I think it's really unique. So uh, I'm going to finish this section on Zizek just with a couple of his quotes because we see how this religious religious conversion it frees you from your old life. It opens up a whole new symbolic identity, a whole new world for you, and it's like you immediately. It's like Paul says, you're, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And uh, this this ability for death drive to be at work in these religious conversions is uh, it shows how much freedom that death drive, despite all the problematic aspects of it, uh, actually has this uh, quality of liberation to it. So, uh, if anybody is listening and you want to go read something by Zizek himself, there's a book called Conversations with Zizek, and I give it my highest recommendation. It is amazing. Uh, yeah, hit, hit hit the amazing. <laughs> mm. Where is it? I'm waiting for it. Amazing. Oh, you want me to actually push it? Here we go. Amazing. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now I feel better. Amazing. Uh, hold on. <laughs> amazing. Okay, so here's where the uh, a really fundamental insight comes in that Zizek points out. And again, if you want to read Zizek, read the book Conversations with Zizek because it's a series of interviews and he's being incredibly clear and he's touching on all of the key aspects of his philosophy. So that's the place to start with Zizek. Um, but oh, he says, cool. the question that really needs to be addressed you. is, are we really simply determined by genes? To put it in naive terms, is it possible to save human freedom in the face of the prospect of the full definition of one's genome, of our biological formula? The true philosophical question that I see here is to reformulate the notion of human freedom in the very context of genetic knowledge and to develop in what sense we would still be free, what autonomy means, and so on. I think it can be done precisely through psychoanalysis and especially the notion of death drive. Death drive is not simply... Uh, right. Death drive is not something that is in our genes. There is no gene for death drive. If anything, death drive is a genetic malfunction. So then he's going to go on to take the point home. Paradoxical as it may sound, psychoanalysis also opts for autonomy. The psychoanalytic name for this autonomy is death drive. Death drive is not something manipulated by circumstances. Death drive just is this non-functional thrust of our libido or will that cannot be explained in objective terms. It means that there is in human beings an aspect of behavior that persists beyond any instrumental activity towards achieving certain goals, pleasure, reproduction, wealth, power. It's a kind of self-sabotaging drive against the usual inscription of psychoanalysis into the naturalistic determinist framework where the human being is controlled by unconscious desires. I think that paradoxically psychoanalysis is the strongest assertion of autonomy. Death drive is the name for autonomy. Now that's huge, right? Because he's saying that the you know, we talk about free will versus determinism, all this. It might not be free will, but he's saying that human beings truly are free from nature because of death drive. That death drive is what separates us from uh, basically being like biological puppets or existing only in deterministic terms because it goes against every natural imperative that you can think of. And Todd McGowan points this out, right? This is why so much of current quote science-based psychology rejects psychoanalysis is because of the concept of death drive 
And why would it reject the concept of death drive? Because it goes against all of Darwin's basic biological principles. The, 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 or, the organism wants to strike up a balance with its environment. It wants to maintain homeostasis. It, 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 it Basically, it wants to be in pleasure. It wants to be uh, uh, safe, secure, all of these kind of things that we associated with pleasure. Death drive is something in us that wants to totally break apart our safety in our environment, our, our self-security, our, uh, our you know stable access to the, the material things that we need to exist. Like, it wants to undermine all of that. And that goes against all of the ways that biology, since Darwin, conceptualize us, right? It's this totally, in, in, in the way that we're talking, it's almost like anti-science, right? Because it goes against every scientific theory of what it is to be a human being as a, you know, as species of in, in the natural world. And so uh, McGowan and Zizek think that this is why science or science-based psychologies or psychiatries have such a problem with psychoanalysis is this concept of death drive. But death drive is precisely why we as human beings are free in a way that other species are not. We interrupt this conversation for a quick message from our sponsors. You may recognize this conversation from the past because it is actually a piece of a longer live stream. So what I've done is I've edited the conversations I had with Mikey down into smaller chunks and I will be releasing those serially until the launch of the Slavoj Zizek's For They Know Not What They Do course taught by Michael Downs and myself. I will be asking him the questions and hystericizing him along with a cohort of people who will be joining us live and in the forums as we do a close reading of what Slavoj Zizek claims is his most important theoretical work, more important than sublime objective ideology by far. He said that if you don't have anything to say about for they know not what they do they keep silent when it comes to sublime objective ideology but we don't just do close thorough hardcore readings we also have some more introductory stuff and so if you go to theory hyphen underground.com forward slash events then you'll be able to see the dates of all of the upcoming events you see that the idea of the university taught by myself brian and and couple of educators who are very close to me and uh, we wanted to focus on Carl Jasper's short work the idea of university as a way to start the year but it's also a way for theory underground to get off on the right track the January 25th is the professional managerial class consciousness course that I'm co-teaching with Elton LK of the working class intelligentsia podcast and then in February on the 25th of February launches GJX4 they know not what they do Mikey has spent two decades getting himself to the point where he feels confident enough to teach this book. And I think that that humility and effort that he's put in is something that we can all learn from. I mean, come on. He's like our own homegrown Zizek. He's like our own like national treasure. I think that we really ought to uplift him and give credit where it's due, not just take him for granted and act like, you know, we don't need to. So that's a part of the reason actually why I really appreciate Brian Becker from Singularity and Sublimity podcast. And he's done a lot of amazing teaching work himself. A lot of people read the blog and then don't give credit where it's due. And that would be fine if he had a cushy academic career with tenure and all that. But he doesn't. He's working in a warehouse supporting his mom. We need to hashtag free Mikey from wage labor so that he can spend more time doing what his passion is, which is teaching philosophy and theory, writing books. That's what we want. More of these kinds of conversations. Make it possible. Make a donation. 5, 15, 20, 50, 100. Make the donation today. Please. It means a lot. Words are cheap. Money? Now that's where it matters. Get your skin in the game. Show Mikey you care. I hope that we'll get to do a lot more of this in the near future. And then the last thing, I'm doing a countrywide tour this year. I will be on the East Coast. I will be on the West Coast. And I will be everywhere in between. So if you want me to come to your town or city, email me. It's down below. If you want to volunteer, be a part of the street team, host or guide while we're there, let me know. I hope to be in a city near you sometime this year. And I hope that you'll take one of my classes. Thanks.